ice is piled up against the northern part of the Canadian archipelago and northern Greenland here. Actually, in the last two years, some of this has disappeared. But 10 to 15 years ago, this multi-year ice would have extended over most of the, the central part of the basin, and it's largely disappeared. And this single-year ice can potentially go very fast. We get a hot summer in the Arctic, and it can melt very quickly because it's only a meter thick or so. Does that matter? Well, we're, we're not really sure, but we do know that ocean water covered by ice is much more reflective. Uh, when you take the ice away, the ocean, the dark ocean water absorbs about 80% more heat energy than uh, ocean water covered by ice. And we also know that the Arctic Basin is pretty big on a planetary scale. It covers about 9% of the surface area of the planet, the area above the the Arctic Circle covers about 9% of the surface area of the northern hemisphere of the planet. So it's a big area. But climate scientists aren't really sure what the implication is of taking that area and switching a large part of it from a white surface to a dark surface for a portion of the year. I was in the Arctic this past summer uh, on the Canadian Canada's most powerful icebreaker, the Louis Saint Laurent. We did a transit of the portion of the Northwest Passage. And uh, I took this photograph as I was coming in the helicopter after we'd been out for a bit of a recon. And, uh, uh, and this is uh, uh, south of Victoria Island. Now, a couple of decades ago, at this time of year, which is about August 3rd, that probably, there were probably been a lot of ice there. It might have even plucked and choked with ice. That day, it was 70, 17 degrees Celsius. Uh, the last couple of months in the Arctic in Igalawit, the temperatures in December, for example, were 15 degrees on average above normal. Uh, something is happening in the Arctic. It's warming much faster than the rest of the planet. Now you might say, oh, okay, that's a concern, but it's a long way away from us. Does it really matter? Again, scientists haven't been really able to figure out exactly what, what it would mean until recently, but now there's, there's some evidence emerging that it might actually matter. It relates directly to what's happening outside our window. So here we have uh, a, an image of uh, uh, basically air pressure over the Arctic Basin, which is right here, in December from 1968 to uh, 1998, so for a 30-year period. This is average across all these years. And what you're looking at in December is that, in general in those years, uh, you had ice formed in, in the Arctic, so you had a certain coat, a coat of ice across the ocean, very cold air, and you got a basin of very dense air over the Arctic like this. And one of the results was that you got what's called a circumpolar vortex, which is a, a, a circular flow of jet stream winds in this direction around the Arctic, around the pole. And you know these jet streams flow across Canada, and they drive a lot of our weather. If you follow the Weather Channel, you know that the jet streams are important for that. Well, this is what happened last winter. Uh, you saw a breakup of that vortex system. Uh, and this, the, the thinking of climate scientists right now, at least some of them, is that what's happening is that that open ocean water in the fall in the Arctic has absorbed a lot of heat through the summer, and then it's re releasing that heat into the ocean during the fall. And that's destabilizing the vortex, which breaks down. Uh, you lose that smooth flow of jet streams counterclockwise around the pole, and one of the results is large quantities of cold air spill out of the Arctic into the continents. This is called the warm Arctic cold continent climate pattern. And, it, and these scientists would argue that at least for last winter, we don't know about this winter yet because the research hasn't been done, but at least for last winter, that's what explains the record low temperatures in places like Siberia and Europe and some of the really nasty winter weather we had in North America last winter. And it might perhaps explain what we've been seeing this winter. Notice that this is a bizarre situation where climate change, uh, global warming as we used to call it, is actually contributing to substantial cooling in some places. You're getting a very dramatic warming in the Arctic, but it's changing circulation patterns and energy movement around the planet to produce a very substantial cooling. We've only just begun to figure this out. That's a surprise. Again, think about what this means for the planning project. When you're trying to think about, well, what kind of climate are these communities going to live in in the future? What kind of energy supply do they need? What, how, how much snow should we design buildings for? Uh, and, and all the other things that you have to think about when you're planning, like the sizes of storm sewers, the 
amount of energy you need to deliver for air conditioning. It turns out that we have a very vague understanding of, in a specific region, what the climate is likely to be like later this century, except to say that it's likely to be very different from what we've experienced in recent history. So let me go on to the energy issue, which is also obviously relevant to the, the planning project. And the two things, climate and energy, are obviously related to each other, because one of the major reasons we have a climate problem, say the major reason, by far the major reason, is the combustion of carbon-based fuel around the planet and the release of some 30 million tons of carbon dioxide, in, excuse me, 30 billion tons of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, the Earth's atmosphere every year. Uh, and and uh, carbon-based fuels, coal, oil, natural gas, uh, still provide about 80% of the world's energy. Big project for all of the smart people in places like Waterloo is to figure out what kind of energy system we're going to have and, and how we're going to implement it as fast as possible that essentially releases no carbon into the atmosphere. Uh, so there is a relationship between energy and climate, but I'm, I'm not going to talk about that relationship very much. I'm going to talk about the energy problem in itself, because it has an independent set of characteristics that make it a real challenge for us. This is an oil rig that I worked on, actually, in the 1970s. It looks like a sort of 1920s or something. But, uh, but really not that long ago. I, I, I got my experience in the energy sector from the ground up, so to speak. I was a roughneck on this rig uh, in northern British Columbia. But I put it up because uh, it gets us thinking about oil. Uh, and oil is really important. Oil provides about 40% of the world's commercial energy, energy bought and sold in the marketplace. And it, uh, uh, and, and it provides about 98% of the world's transportation energy. It's literally the stuff that the world's economy moves around on. You don't have oil, things don't move. And the world is currently configured. And it's really special stuff. Most people don't realize. And you think about the energy density of oil. You take three tablespoons of crude oil, have as much free energy in them as would be expended by an adult male laborer in an entire day's physical labor. Every time you fill up your gas tank, a standard North American car with a full tank of gas, you're putting the equivalent of two years of manual labor into your gas tank. So during the oil age, which began, interestingly enough, in Ontario with the first commercial discovery of oil in Oil Springs, Ontario in 1858, if anybody says it was in Titusville, Pennsylvania, it's only wrong. It's a Canadian factoid that we should all know about. It. So it began in 1858 in Oil Springs, Ontario. That oil age, especially during the 20th century, was a period of time where we had essentially a whole bunch of free slaves working for us individually. Each one of us had a bunch of free slaves. So during that period of time, during the 20th century, uh, the world's population moved from, from uh, 1.5 billion to 6 billion people, so it quadrupled in size. Uh, our agricultural production per capita during that time excuse me, our agricultural production per hectare, the amount of grain, wheat, rice, corn that we grew per hectare during that time also quadrupled. So we multiplied our population four times, we multiplied our output per hectare four times. Our input of energy during that time went up 80-fold per hectare, 8-0. What we learned to do in the 20th century to a large extent, thanks to this stuff, was to drill down into the ground, extract oil and natural gas, convert oil and natural gas into food and eat the food. At least 50% of the people on the planet right now would not be alive if it weren't for cheap energy. Well, that situation is changing. It's changing, uh, we know, because of estimates like this. This is from the Energy Information Administration in the United States. Now, the Energy Information Administration is a very conservative organization. Uh, they still can't say the phrase peak oil. Uh, but they are coming to terms with the fact that we're running into what appear to be serious world supply constraints. So here we have from 2008 to 2030, this is the number of million barrels a day, a day of production. So here we are at around 85 million barrels a day. Total world consumption is expected to increase 